My name is Marcus Ford. I'm an attending at the Camel Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee. Our mission at the Camel Clinic is to provide world-class orthopedic care to our patients and world-class orthopedic training to our residents and fellows. We actually have one of the oldest orthopedic residency programs in the country. Um, we serve as the uh, faculty for the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, and we author Campbell's Operative, which is read by both surgeons in the United States and worldwide. My practice primarily involves hip and knee reconstruction with a special emphasis on revision hip and knee surgery. I trained in residency here at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis, Tennessee, and did a fellowship in hip and knee reconstruction at Washington University in St. Louis. So prosthetic joint infection, or PGI, is the leading cause of failure in joint arthroplasty today. If you look at primary arthroplasty, the infection rate is currently reported at 1 to 2 percent, although uh, that actually may be underreported with a higher infection rate. Prosthetic joint infection is fairly morbid uh, and carries a significant mortality to the patient. If you look at five-year mortality rates, some reports are as high as 20 percent. So as the number of primary total joint arthroplasties increase with an aging and obese population, um, it's likely that as we see an increased number of total joint arthroplasties done, we're also going to see an increase in the number of infections that we treat. So currently, uh, a two-stage revision for prosthetic joint infection is the gold standard for either those folks with chronic prosthetic joint infection or a failed DARE procedure or a debridement and irrigation and retention. There's quite a bit of literature to support a two-stage revision for PJI, with some success rates showing as high as 95% in terms of appropriate treatment of infection. So in fellowship, I actually trained mostly on static spacers. Since I've gotten a practice, I've actually transitioned to almost exclusively using OsteoRemedy's articulating spacers. So the first thing we have to look at is comparing articulating spacers to static spacers. What we do know is that the patients have an easier time with their spacer when it's articulating. The patient can obviously bend their joint more, uh, they have more uh, functional motion, and they can perform their activities of daily living easier. At the time of surgery, it's easier on the surgeon, for example, on a knee, because the knee actually bends well and the exposure is easier. In addition to that, the patient has an easier time getting their range of motion after surgery. There are several studies out there that also show trends towards improved infection rates when comparing articulating spacers to static spacers. So osteoremedy spacers are designed with both the surgeon and the patient in mind. First off, they're pre-made, which means I don't have to take time during the operating procedure to make a spacer out of a mold. They come in various sizes and they have uh, stems and augments available uh, that can be easily unitized during the surgery to address certain bony deficiencies or defects. They come with trials that really help make it easy to decide what size and what augments are needed. Most importantly, osteoremedy spacers offer local antibiotic elution over a long period of time. So when static spacers or metal on polyethylene spacers offer days of antibiotic elution, osteoremedy spacers offer weeks to months of local antibiotic elution, thus helping you aggressively treat infection. A one and a half stage revision has also been recently reported. A one and a half stage revision is where a metal and polyethylene low demand implant is used as the first stage spacer in a two stage revision for PJI. Um, but if the infection is treated appropriately and the implant hasn't loosened, uh, the low demand metal and polyethylene implant is retained. I think as surgeons we're naive to think that we can eradicate every bacterium from a joint when we go in on the first stage of a two stage revision for PJI. We're also trained that metal implants plus bacteria equals biofilm, and that's really the most difficult thing to treat in prosthetic joint infection. I feel much more comfortable with an antibiotic spacer that elutes local antibiotics in terms of resistance to biofilm formation and aggressive treatment of infection. So I think ultimately one problem with one and a half stage revisions is that we're dealing with low functioning implants. Oftentimes I have patients who are very functional prior to their infection, and after they undergo a two-stage, I really want to give them an implant that gets them back to the quality of life and the higher level of function that they're accustomed to. I really don't see many patients in my practice that would benefit from retention of a low-demand implant if their infection is appropriately treated after the first stage. So I do have inherent bias. Uh, there were several surgeons in the community uh, that were using metal and polyethylene as articulating spacers for treatment of infection. Oftentimes, I'd see patients that were still infected that I'd have to do true two-stage revisions on. In addition to that, in an attempt to do a one-and-a-half stage, oftentimes I would see these patients with loosened components. They had substantial bone loss that required significant revisions. Oftentimes, when I'd go back at the time of their replant, I'd have to use augments, sleeves, or cones 
uh, to revise their tibias, granted there was such substantial bone loss. I think we have to be careful when it comes to metal and polyethylene. Advocates for metal and polyethylene argue that the upfront implant costs um, are marginally better when compared to a pre-made eluding antibiotic articulating spacer. However, I think for any of the failures and or the significant reconstructions that are required, we're potentially trading early marginal implant savings to significant cost on the back end when these patients either have to be retreated for a recurrent infection or they have to require substantial reconstructive surgery at the time of their replant. So I've had great success with osteoremedy spacers for the past five years. Specifically to the hip, I feel like the spacer is comfortable for patients. The large head gives me satisfaction with stability, and in addition to that, I feel really good about local long-term elution of vancomycin. When it comes to the knee, I really appreciate the efficiency that osteoremedy spacers provide. I don't have to take time fabricating a spacer during the case. The trials work really well with my flow. The implants come with stems and augments that are easily unitized during surgery to help address any bone deficiencies or defects. And then of course I get local elution of antibiotics over a long period of time. When I come back to replant a knee, I feel that the spacers are easily removed and I've got excellent preservation of bone. Prosthetic joint infection remains the leading cause of failure in total joint arthroplasty today. It's one of the most difficult things that I take care of in my practice. I feel like osteoremedy spacers provide my patients with the best treatment option for management of their infection.